So thank you everyone for joining us for our Conservation Voices uh, webinar. Uh, the title of our speaker's uh, presentation to tonight or today, uh, this morning, is Communicating Science, Key Takeaways from 20 or More Years Running Monga Bay. Uh, so since 1999, Monga Bay has grown from a guy in his pajamas on a laptop to a new service that operates five bureaus has a network of over 600 journalists in 80 countries and attracts 8 million readers a month. Monga Bay founder Red Ayers Butler will talk about his journey and pre present some of the things he's learned about uh, how to effectively communicate science and persuade journalists to cover your research. So Red is a founder and CEO of Monga Bay, which is a non-profit conservation news organization Beyond Monga Bay, Rhett has advised a range of organizations and institutions from news outlets to philanthropic foundations to development agencies. Rhett was the first journalist to win the Field Museum's Parker Gentry Award. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rhett. Rhett, thanks for joining us today, and we're looking forward to your talk. Great. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you everyone for joining so I'm going to share my screen um, so you can see my presentation. And how does that look, Tony? Yes, it looks great, right? All righty. Um, yeah, so to start out, um, I want to provide just a background on Monga Bay because uh, probably the top question I get asked is what's the origin of the site. So from there, we're going to talk about um, the structure of Monga Bay and then some of the things uh, we've, I've learned about communicating science um, over the course of running the organization. Um, so Monga Bay was uh, really born out of my childhood. So I had the great fortune of having a mother who is a travel agent and a father who traveled a lot for business. And so as a result, we were able to have opportunities to travel um, you know, that most people don't have. And so instead of going to say Disneyland or you know, amuse another amusement park, we would go to places like Venezuela. Um, and I always had a special interest in herps, um, so reptiles and amphibians. So I would wanna go to the rainforest because I felt like the rainforest had the most interesting uh, herps. And so um, a few times my um, you know, parents uh, did take me to the rainforest and I had, you know, just really amazing experiences. Um, the thing that moved me from sort of just enjoying nature to being more engaged and being more aware of what was happening was um, when I was 12, I went to Eastern Ecuador near, near Yasuni National Park, and we stayed with a fairly traditional indigenous community. Um, so while I was there, I just, you know, had a great time with the kids my age, looking for frogs, uh, fish, things like that. I came home and a few months later, there was a front page story in the San Francisco Chronicle about an oil spill that had happened on the Rio Napo upriver from where I'd been. And so what that meant is that whole area I just, vi I just visited was coated in an oil slick. And so all I could think about is what had happened to my friends in the forest and the animals. Um, so that really kind of gave me a much greater awareness of sort of the environmental component of, of nature. Um, but the thing that actually moved me to action was um, when I was 17, uh, I went to Borneo and had a, a really amazing experience uh, in this forest in Saba. Um, so um, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with the forest of Saba, but you know, they're incredibly biodiverse um, with you know, great insects and of course, amazing herbs and um, you know, great uh, megafauna as well. And so I had a, a really you know, special time in this forest hiking under the, you know, the beautiful trees and seeing wildlife. And um, I kept in correspondence with a scientist there and um, a few months after I visited, that area was pulped uh, to, for, uh, to make paper, and then eventually became an oil palm plantation. And so uh, in that forest destruction, it went from something that looked like this to something that looked more like this. And so that inspired me to try to do something. And so when I started in college, um, I began writing a book about rainforests that was based heavily off of research. And so I spent my college career working on this book um, my major is actually um, management, ec management science economics. So it's like math and economics and business. Um, so it had nothing to do with, with rainforests or ecology, but that's where I'm at, my passion was. And so 
Um, thanks to some credit from high school, I was able to finish school, uh, finish university year early. I spent that extra year working on this book. Um, I found publisher, it went through peer reviews. Um, publisher came back and said, okay, we're ready to, to publish this book. Um, but because we're an academic press, we don't have money to put pictures in it. So we're just going to put, you know, to have some grayscale images. And so it's basically going to be a textbook. And to me, that defeated the purpose of what I was trying to do, which was convey the beauty of rainforests and why they're important. And so I thought, well, I didn't write this book for money. I wrote it for impact. And so I decided to post it on the internet so people could read it for free. And I decided to name it after an island off Madagascar. Um, so I, I called it Manga Bay, um, which is, you know, an anglicized uh, pronunciation and, and spelling of, of, of this island. But um, the reason I, I chose that, it was, a, it was a very special place to me. So um, it's an island that's covered with rainforests. Uh, it has great herbs, of course, but then it also has lemurs and weird creatures like uh, the tenric. And the island is ringed by coral reefs and has um, a breeding population of humpback whales nearby. So it's kind of like my idea of paradise. And so I chose that name because it's totally unique. And so if you went on the internet and searched with Alta Vista or you know whatever search engine used back then, um, it was very easy to see um, who was talking about Manga Bay. And so that was the origin. But the reality was I wasn't going to run a website for a living. And so I started working. I, I got a real job working in, in Silicon Valley and um, just working for like a small startup. Um, you know, doing that kind of thing. But on nights and weekends, I continued to, to work on Manga Bay. And then um, in mid 2003, um, I put advertising on the website. And so the ads were based off the content on a page. So if there's a, a page about lemurs, there'd be, you know, ads for flights to Madagascar. And because the site was popular, um, it started to generate revenue. And um, so within about six months, the revenue from the site was equal to about half my take home pay. And so I thought, well, maybe I quit my, quit my job and pursue my passion. And so that's what I decided to do. Um, so once I started doing Manga Bay full time, um, I started to create a lot more content. So one of the first things I did was create a section for children about rainforests um, that was then um, adapted by native speakers into about 40 languages. Um, I also launched um, the, the, well, I also started to take photos everywhere I went because I didn't want to have a problem of not having photos again. So I've now taken, and posted about 150,000 photos on, on the website, which you know, get used all the time in articles. Um, but Manga Bay, I also launched the news service, which is what Manga Bay is best known for now. Um, so the first few years of Manga Bay News, it was just it was just me writing articles. So you know, I was traveling and interacting with with researchers and experts, but um, you know, just pumping out a lot of, pumping out a lot of content. And people thought Manga Bay was a much larger entity than it was. Um, you know, which in reality was just you know me. Um, in 2008, I brought on an intern, uh, who ended up joining the team. Um, and so the two of us, you know, were Manga Bay. Um, but I had a lot of ideas that I wanted to pursue that there was no sort of business model for. And I could kind of see that online advertising was never going to get to the point where Manga Bay could really grow and sort of realize the vision for having more impact. And so, um, one example of, of sort of that impact I wanted to have, or, or so the opportunity was um, in Indonesia. So what I did, so the reason I, I saw Indonesia as being interesting was um, in the 2000s, uh, Indonesia has had you know, a very high deforestation rate. And a lot of the deforestation in Indonesia was a result of um, natural resources management and especially corruption around how concessions are granted. And so I thought, well, journalism is actually an intervention that could have um, an impact uh, because if you increase transparency, it creates more accountability in the system. And maybe Indonesia could tip more towards what happened in Brazil in the 2000s, where Brazil had this sky, uh, this sky high deforestation rate that was reduced by about 80% over the course of eight years. Of course, that's, that's different. I mean, that's reversed now. But um, the point was is that I thought that journalism could actually have an impact. And so I formed a nonprofit in order to start raising money for you know, these new ideas. And the first project um, that uh, we undertook was launching uh, Manga Bay Indonesia, which was an uh, Indonesian environmental news service. So um, I applied for a grant. Um, I got it the day the day I got it. I announced three job job openings in Indonesia that were um, you know they were posted in English and Indonesian. Um, two weeks later, I went over and interviewed the top forty applicants for the position and hired the team. We launched um, the site within about. A month and a half after that, and, and within a month of within a month of launching, it was the most popular Indonesian language environmental news service. So it took off um, really quickly. 
And um, one of the interesting things about Indonesia was back then um, it had much higher um, usage of social media. So it was a place where you could test ideas uh, before they kind of uh, emerged in places like the United States. Um, and so one of the interesting things we did in Indonesia was start to build out a network of journalists um, all across the country. Um, and I thought, well, this is something that could be really valuable on a global basis since, you know, Mangabe covers issues around the world. And so um, to sort of test that theory and sort of how it would work logistically, um, in 2014, um, there was a new platform that launched called Global Forest Watch that probably everyone knows now, but back then it wasn't very well known. So Global Forest Watch, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, aggregates data from all different sources and puts it on a map. Um, around forests. And so I wanted to test out whether this tool could actually be a mechanism for doing reporting. So I decided to do a kind of like a pilot. And so what I did is I um, found an interesting point um, on Global Forest Watch uh, in North Sumatra and Aceh um, on the island of Sumatra. And so this is just, um, you know, a, a photo from back then. And so the the blue area is, is supposedly a protected area. The pink uh, shows potential deforestation in terms of change in vegetation index. And so I was very interested in kind of this middle, this part of the middle where there's um, kind of like a peninsula where there's some pink popping up in what's, you know, uh, on paper a protected area. And so if you do a satellite overlay, you can see that the pink is popping up over what is clearly forest. So, you know, there's something interesting going on there. And so I started basically, you know, from my my home in, or my apartment in California, and um, uh, brought together a team of Indonesians. We went to go visit, do a site visit. And so what we found was an illegal road leading to this um, to this oil palm plantation that had just been established within this protected area. And um, I went down and spoke with the workers, and they said, um, you know, every, every few days or every every you know couple of weeks we have to chase off elephants with tongue nests that were you know in the trees so you know at some some point in the previous few months there had been um you know great apes in this habitat so um uh from that idea we ended up doing some reporting and it sort of de demonstrated a proof of concept and so from there we started to build up this network of journalists um, all over the world. And so um, we currently have about 800 journalists in about 80 countries. Um, this data is from a couple of years ago, um, but they're really scattered all over the world. Um, at the same time, we also started to build out um, these bureaus. And so we have um, bureaus around languages and geographies. And so, you know, the first bureau was the Indonesian Language um, Bureau, but then we launched um, a Spanish uh, Language Bureau for Latin America. We launched an India Bureau, which first was in English, but we've now added Hindi. We added a Brazil Bureau, and we're soon going to be launching a French Bureau targeting West and Central Africa. And so each of these bureaus has um, in-house capacity in terms of staff writers and editors. And then those editors work uh, while they build and work with a network of journalists who are local in country. Um, so... For example, um, this can be very useful with the pandemic because we implemented a global moratorium on travel uh, back in March 2020, um, but we were still able to do um, reporting um, because we had journalists in country who were able to go out to the field um, depending on you know, the, the local COVID situation. And so we've continued to produce content despite having a, a freeze on global travel or international travel. Um, so our staff, again, is, um, is is diverse from all over the world. And so, you know, our Indonesian staff is almost entirely Indonesian. So, um, you know, while Mongabi was born in the United States, um, our U.S. staff is uh, really a minority of, of um, you know, the organization now. So what have we learned from all this? Well, um, there's a few kind of macro trends that everyone on this call is probably aware of, but I figure it's probably worth highlighting, um, you know, just to reiterate some of these things. So um, one thing is uh, about trends on the internet. So I think we're all aware that um, people's attention spans are much shorter than they were, um, say, 10 or 20 years ago, which leads to this um, desire for instant gratification. Um, we've also seen, especially in the past five years, a sort of lack of discernment skills. So people not being able to determine what's real or fake or how to understand um, you know, what are the key elements of some, that makes something factual? 
Um, and there's also sort of a, a quickness to anger or pass judgment without actually trying to understand something. So these are all very challenging um, things to navigate from a um, you know environmental journalism perspective. Um, so we've tried to um, you know make adjustments to you know <laughs> to this new world. And so one of the things we've implemented, which you know is again probably seems very obvious now, but when we did it several years ago is um, pretty new is for every story having bullet bullet point summary. So it does, it allows someone to, you know, quickly get a sense of an article without reading it. Cause otherwise we were finding that people were otherwise sometimes using an article just making a decision based off of a title or a photo. So just adding a little bit more context, even though it's not much can help, um, uh, you know, fill in a few gaps. And the hope is that they actually will then read the article and, you know, draw, draw conclusions that are, that are better informed. Um, we also use um, eye-catching images and strong titles for both um, showing up in search results uh, and social media, uh, but we try to avoid clickbait because um, clickbait usually ends up just disappointing people um, and isn't particularly productive. Um, we've also started producing a lot more short-form videos, so we're producing probably about 50 videos a month, maybe more um, across our bureaus, and so that um, we find that video tends to reach a very different audience. So it's more of like a mass market audience. But that said, even people who are in, say, like the Ministry of Forestry and Environment in Indonesia, like those decision makers will also watch video. So it's more of sort of like a broad approach to, to reaching people. And the hope is, is that if they watch a video and they want to learn more, then they can read the longer form article to get more context. Um, sort of... Uh, another thing we're doing is we cite sources um, and include links. And so that's a way for people to learn more about something and understand sort of like the factual basis from where an article has come from. Uh, and then in terms of sort of the judgmental quick to anger um, problem, um, we don't waste a lot of time dealing with trolls because there's essentially an endless army of trolls who are just um, have a lot more time to attack you than you have to sort of deal with them. So we generally have a hands-off policy and just sort of ignore them. Um, so who are Mongabay's readers? So um, we have user groups rather than sort of like a typical user. Um, a majority of our English traffic is international, which is unusual for a US-based organization. Um, our readership is more educated than average. Um, so we have very heavily skewed towards people who have master's degrees and above um, or other forms of professional degrees. Um, and our readership includes key decision makers. Um, so what does that actually mean? Like who are these people or who are these groups? So one of our, you know, kind of original groups was conservation practitioners. So that's everyone from, you know, working universities to NGO staff, staff to um, people who are out in the field, like, you know, rangers. Um, we also have a large readership among advocacy groups and activists. So that would be like, you know, Greenpeace or Global Witness. Um, educators are another group. Um, people who work in the uh, natural resources management agencies, um, overseas development agencies, international financial, financial institutions. So that'd be like the UN, uh, USAID, the World Bank, um, the US State Department. Um, people who manage or are involved with corporate commodity supply chains. So that would be someone who's like in, source, uh, in charge of sourcing palm oil for say like Unilever or something like that. Um, we also have people in the financial sector who are often analysts who are working on ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance funds. Um, so they're interested in our content to get um, information and intelligence. Oops. Okay. Um, to get information on investments, um, philanthropic institutions, so like foundations. Uh, and then public prosecutors um, who are investigating environmental crime. Um, so because we have kind of this broad sort of section of, 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 um, of audience, um, we try to write in a style that's mass market. Um, so it's really, it's not overly technical, it's more general interest. Well, we try and engage users with images and graphics. We use interesting titles and we publish in multiple languages. So I think the key thing there is we try to meet people where they're at rather than providing them with overly technical information that um, may not be relevant to you know, most of our users. 
Um, so in terms of, you know, practical tips of, you know, how this can inform your work. Um, so one of the important things to do is to identify who your audience is. And so if you're, uh, if you're a scientist who is, um, you know, doing research and publishing papers on a certain topic, um, it's very useful to understand who would actually use your research uh, for their decision making or, you know, consume your papers. And so think about that, um, you know, along those lines, um, if they're journalists who you've noticed uh, tend to cover issues around your area of work, um, it could be a good idea to follow them um, and their institutions. Um, you know, to sort of get a sense of who they are, um, understand what stories they, you know, they find interesting, and then start to try engage with them. So, you know, that might be through a social media, it might through some, be some sort of outreach. Um, but that can be very useful in helping yourself um, and uh, promote your research down the road. Um, it's also very useful to understand what makes an interesting story. Um, and so I'll get a little bit into this later, but um, providing context. So why does your research matter and what makes it newsworthy? So one of the things to be aware of is journalists are constantly bombarded by story ideas and pitches as well as sort of pressure from editors and other parties. And so, I mean, just for example, at Manga Bay, we cover between, between about one and 2% of the, of the story ideas that come in. So only a very small minority of, of papers and news items actually get covered. And that's just a capacity issue. We just only have so much capacity to, to you know, work on stories. And so um, for that reason, it's really important to be able to explain your research in a way that's compelling and easily summarized and understood. Um, so with that in mind, um, you should always be thinking about how can you make it easy for journalists to cover your work? Um, so that can be things like um, producing supporting content, so writing a press release. So if you work at an institution, um, sometimes you'll have a, you know, your institution can, can support you by helping, uh, you know, by bringing in the press office to, to generate a press release. You can also do this on your own if you don't have that institutional support. I mean, it's harder, but, um, you know, it's something to be aware of. If you want to see kind of what press releases typically look like, you go to a source like eurekaalert.org and see kind of like the structure of a normal press release and kind of what are the elements of like quotes and things like that. Um, and so um, when you are providing quotes, either for your own press release or to the press or to your press office, um, it's important to make those non-technical. So put your research and its implications in terms that the average person can understand and, and finds interesting. Um, it can also be really helpful to provide graphics and charts and pictures if you have them from your work, um, because um, that can just make it easier for a journalist to sell their editor saying like, oh, there's some great visuals for this study. So, you know, let's do a story about it. Um, and then when you interact with journalists, um, providing them with a paper along with a citation is really useful. So, um, you know, most, um, most news outlets don't have resources to go and pay for um, journal subscriptions. So if you're able to provide, you know, the author copy to them, it's just very helpful and will be, will kind of like increase the likelihood that they'll cover your research. Um, the last really important tip is just being responsive. So if you are contacted by a journalist, um, be ready to provide comment if you do want to comment. Um, and you should be able to communicate concisely, um, again, speaking in sound bites. And so um, you know, one of the frustrations I know from sort of the researcher side is when um, an article comes out about their work, sometimes the journalist doesn't get all the details right, or there's, you know, something off about it. And so that can sometimes be the product of um, sort of lack of understanding or, you know, like gaps in communication. So, um, you know, having the ability to communicate, communicate, communicate concisely and just provide answers to any questions journalists can ask can or ask can kind of reduce the likelihood of, of them getting the story wrong or getting you know the story wrong about your paper. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about Mongabay's distribution. So it's something that's important to understand um, you know, as you engage with journalists. So um, Mongabay has global readership, as I mentioned before. Um, we have content across multiple channels. Um, so that includes our own website, our social media channels, but um, we also have distribution via third parties. So for example, um, our Spanish language LATAM Bureau 
has partnerships with between 30 and 35 mainstream media outlets across Latin America. And so a fair number of our stories are being um, republished in you know, mainstream newspapers. And so it's not just readership on Manga Bay or social media, but it's also readership in those, in those third, party, third party publications. Um, for Manga Bay, social media is really important. So it's our top source of traffic and engagement for us. So we are uh, quite engaged on social media. And so that's what we use as a distribution platform. Um, so again, this is kind of getting at our strategy, but um, we produce original content in multiple languages in order to, peep, again, to meet people where they're at and, um, you know, have impact in those markets. So for example, you know, in Indonesia, we know that um, decision makers are much more likely to read in Indonesian than they are in English. And so if we can provide them with Indonesian content, then it's more likely to, you know, to find that audience. Um, we distribute all of our content under an open Creative Commons license, which means that anyone can use our content um, for free, commercially or non-commercially. So again, that's how that's why we have a lot of pickup by um, other media outlets. Um, and we also embrace social media, both the good and the bad. I mean, I think social media is probably um, a net negative for journalism um, and uh, you know the work that we do. But the reality is, is that's where people are, and so you know, again, we need to meet people where they are and provide, provide our content on those platforms. So, you know, we sort of, you know, hold our nose and engage on social media, despite all the um, problems that cause, you know, that, that's, that's associated with social media. Um, so on the social media front, uh, it is important, um, but it's, it's easy to do badly. So if you're getting started as a researcher and, you know, trying to build your brand or find, you know, to find another position, you know, looking, if you're, you know, looking for a postdoc position or something, it's, it's very useful to sort of establish a presence and become a known entity. So if you decide to do that via social media, um, you should pick your platforms carefully and understand how they work. So it's more valuable to do, to be really good at one platform than to do all the, all the platforms badly. Um, so, you know, different platforms have different um, sort of goals and audiences. Um, so it's important to understand who your audience is. Like if you're trying to meet, to, to reach like a, you know, a, a university professor or something like that, like, you know, what, where, where are they getting their content from and is it worth establishing a presence there? Um, so it's also very useful to understand the benefits of risk of social media. So it's good to establish your own rules of engagement. So are you going to engage with trolls who are primarily just attacking you for the sake of attacking you? Um, like, how do you want to, how much time do you want to spend on that? So it's, it's easy to get kind of sucked down into a vortex that's not very productive on social media. Um, so that for that reason, um, it's important to know what your goals are and then measure progress against them. And then, you know, periodically reevaluate re your strategy. So if you're like trying to build up an audience, um, you know, you can just buy a bunch of social media followers, but that doesn't actually achieve anything because it's an audience that has no value. So you wanna be building up an audience of people who are actually, it's actually meaningful that they're consuming your content. So again, just try to be strategic because it's easy to sort of waste a lot of time or fall into pitfalls on social media in terms of your, you know, building your professional career. I mean, on, on your personal side, you know, it's whatever that is, you know, it's, it's how we want to pursue it, but I'm speaking just specifically from like a professional standpoint. Um, so pitching Manga Bay. So um, Manga Bay, as I mentioned before, our structure is, is we have editors who typically manage certain beats. And then we have um, staff writers who, um, you know, are, are part of staff and do regular reporting. And then we have this network of journalists. And so if you want to pitch your, your research to, uh, to Manga Bay, um, a good place to start is identifying um, a writer, so someone who has bylines on the site who seems to cover topics that are related to your research. Um, if you can't really figure out who that is, um, you can try just sending uh, a message to editor at mangabay.com. And so that comes directly into our news desk and then someone will be there evaluating it and then we'll direct it to the right person. That said, um, you know, we only cover a small fraction of the actual story pitches that come in, but um, that's the process. Um, I don't recommend copying a whole bunch of people. So if you like go and mine the contact page and pick out a bunch of people and copy them all, 
um, that will greatly reduce the likelihood that your pitch will get picked up or even seen because people will tend to say, okay, well, there were nine other people copied on this. So this isn't, this isn't something I have to worry about because someone else will deal with it. Um, when you craft your message, um, it's a good idea to have a, a title that it, that's pretty succinct that explains, you know, what, what point you're trying to make. And then, um, in the first, like try to aim for keeping it short and concise in terms of your message. So uh, at most, um, a few, you know, a few sentences that are sort of easy to read, maybe use bullet points. And then at the bottom, you can always have like your, the full summary or all the context, but you're really trying to just engage people who are getting a whole bunch of pitches. You just want to make that compelling, um, pitch just right at the outset. So, you know, keep it, keep it short, um, with additional context at the bottom. Um, if you have a paper or a press release, um, uh, sending as an attachment is, is a good strategy. And I would uh, advise waiting a week before sending a follow-up message. Um, so, you know, this has been sort of a lot of information, which I realize. Um, I want to just highlight one case study of what can happen from a, a piece of journalism when kind of all the pieces come together. Um, so this is one of my favorite sort of uh, impact stories from, uh, from that, that emerged from uh, Mongabe reporting. So back in, um, back in 2014, um, there was, it was sort of like the end of the commodity super cycle. So most commodity prices were declining. Um, cacao was the one commodity that was increasing. So um, there was a company that had an IPO called United Cacao um, and they pitched themselves as being a sustainable producer of cacao that was, you know, working with communities and, you know, was the only pure play cacao company that was public. And so, um, you know, they had a successful public offering. They had this really nice storyline. Um, so that was happening kind of in the financial markets. Um, meanwhile, um, at the same time, um, we at Mongabe were monitor monitoring uh, Global Forest Watch for, you know, interesting stuff that was popping up. And so, um, Around that time, we saw some pink polygons popping up in the Peruvian Amazon, which is one of the most biodiverse uh, places on Earth. And we started, we sent an investigative reporter, started to dig into it. We started interacting with um, a bunch of local researchers from the Amazon Conservation Association. And it turned out that that company, which had had the IPO, was actually clearing primary forest in the Peruvian Amazon. So what it had been saying about how it wasn't clearing any forest and it was sustainable, um, didn't seem to be holding up to scrutiny. And so the more we dug into it, the more we found, um, and it became a really interesting story. Um, the company tried to um, stop us from publishing. So they sent us some, um, some legal threats, but we were able to respond to those legal threats by saying, we don't have libel or slander because every, all the information we're providing here is from the world's top scientists. So for example, um, Greg Asner, who was at the Carnegie Institution at the time, had flown over this area with his airplane using LIDAR sensors and had mapped um, every tree at, at high resolution for carbon value and also biodiversity. So there was sort of that, that baseline. Uh, and then we had the satellite data, which would show how the, the force conversion was happening. And then we also had you know, the journalistic approach, which was interviewing people on the ground about what had happened. So there was this ton of evidence to support this story. And so we proceeded with the story uh, and then did a bunch of reporting after that. But we came out with the story and then a whole bunch of other media outlets picked up on it. And, um, you know, again, well, this is, this is kind of, this is the showing the, the high resolution satellite imagery. And you can see that there's full size trees on the ground here. So this is clearly forest that's been cleared. Um, so we, um, we did this reporting, a bunch of other media outlets did it, and then NGOs started doing advocacy ca campaigns around it. For example, the Environmental Investigative Agency started um, targeting the London Stock Exchange uh, investors saying like, this company is breaching your, your, uh, your rules. And so um, fast forward to, to um, January, 2017, um, the company was delisted from London Stock Exchange. And so the reason that was important was it had been planning to expand its operations um, to clear um, up nearly 100,000 hectares of forest for both cacao and oil palm plantations. So it turned out this company was part of a web of other companies, which included several um, uh, palm oil producers. And so 
that area of deforestation that was effectively avoided when it was delisted um, amounts to about um, you know 133 percent the size of Singapore. Um, if you want to put that in carbon terms, it's about 29 million metric tons of carbon emissions avoided, which is the equivalent of about 72 billion miles ruined by passenger car. So this um, this is a really cool story because it showed what can happen when journalism comes together with good science and then advocacy um, to produce, you know, a real world outcome. And so, you know, what were some of the key elements of the success of that? So one is that there was really good data that was well visualized. So again, um, you know, this is a carbon map. Um, well, I know it's not a carbon map, it's a land use change map, but um, the pink shows, um, you know, the most recent uh, change in forest cover. And so the graphics just around this were very visually attractive, which, you know, made it easier to tell the story. Um, that story was also very compelling. You had biodiversity, you had um, their elements of questionable corporate behavior, questionable government behavior. Um, there were local and indigenous peoples who were affected by this. So there were all, sort of all the plot points were there for making a good story. Um, there were diverse voices. So um, again, I mentioned there were scientists, there were third party media publications, um, there were public prosecutors in Peru, um, there were advocacy groups. So all these entities had a role in, in, you know, in, in resulting in this impact. Uh, and then there's just tenacity, the fact that, um, uh, I mean, Manga Bay kind of had to press through a lot to do this reporting, but then all these other entities also had to push through a lot. Um, the, companies, the company um, filed all sorts of lawsuits. Some of these lawsuits are, we're still dealing with, um, but you know, people were persistent in, in pursuing the story and um, getting that information out there and it ended up making a difference. So I'll wrap up there. I wanna leave plenty of time for questions, but hopefully that provides um, you know, some good context on, on my journey with Manga Bay and you know, how we work and then some of the, the impacts of, the, of, of journalism. Thanks very much, Rhett. That was really a great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your advice to uh, our, our conservation scientists on how they can get their message out. Uh, so we'll open up for questions now. And if you're thinking of asking a question, please do type it into the chat and we'll present the questions to, to Rhett. And Rhett also uh, can see them coming up there on the screen. So. Uh, We'll uh, leave a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, we have one question that's just uh, turned up here from uh, Yahoo Law. Uh, uh, Red, how do you think Mongo Bay has changed, impacted local environmental journalism, particularly in Southeast Asia, where you started Mongo Bay Indonesia? Um, so I think in some markets where Mongo Bay has a presence is it's created um, new opportunities for journalists to, to report on environmental issues. So we find that some of our contributors um, will moonlight for Manga Bay, so they may write for a mainstream media outlet, but they don't really get to cover some of the controversial environmental issues. Um, you know, a place like Indonesia, one of, the, one of the problems is that a lot of the media outlets are owned uh, by conglomerates, which may also own mining and palm oil companies. And so um, these journalists just have an opportunity now to do reporting on these issues they find important, um, which they couldn't other, otherwise do. Um, We've also had a couple situations where, um, because Manga Bay is an international outlet, um, we're able to do reporting that local outlets cannot do. So, for example, um, you know, in a, in a place like Malaysia, um, because of the media law, um, sometimes um, media outlets may be hesitant to report on certain issues. But if Manga Bay does a story, then a media outlet can say Manga Bay reported this, so it's like legally on Manga Bay but then that outlet can add local color. And so it provides sort of like cover for doing, for doing reporting on some controversial issues. We've seen the same, the same thing in Indonesia where Manga Bay Global will do some, a story on corruption um, and or like around like a palm oil plantation or something like that. And then other media outlets can cover it, including Manga Bay Indonesia. Whereas if Manga Bay Indonesia led with a story, they could be hit by a barrage of, of you know, lawsuits that may or may not be frivolous um, just because of the way the media, media, media law works in Indonesia. Great, and a related question, uh, Red, is, you know, you've got a presence in 80 countries, 600 journalists, 
and you cover a, a very broad range of topics. Where has it been most difficult to be an environmental journalist uh, in the last decade? And which topics that you cover are considered most sensitive? Well, so it really depends on the jurisdiction. So, um, I mean, like right now, Myanmar is a very difficult, a difficult place to do any reporting. Um, so we had planned to hire a staffer there and right before the coup and the coup basically, you know, uh, postponed that plan. So there are a couple of types of threats. So there's physical security threats, which is always a concern to us. And we are constantly monitoring sort of geop geopolitical risk and local conditions to see whether our journalists are, particularly, uh, are potentially at risk for, um, you know, violence or arrest. Um, another type of risk is just sort of like legal risk. So you, in some jurisdictions, the rules around um, sort of libel and slander and freedom of the press are very weak. And so, um, you know, if, you, if you're a powerful business person and you don't like a story, then you can just pay someone to arrest a journalist without any sort of grounds. And so that can also be a risk. And so we see these risks in a lot of markets. So, I mean, like the risk of violence is very high in Latin America, for example. So like Colombia, Guatemala, uh, Mexico, um, there's a lot of threats and violence against journalists. Um, this, I mean, including journalists who report on environmental issues. Um, the legal issues I see more, I guess, in Asia. So like, Indi like India, Singapore, um, Indonesia have all passed laws um, in recent months, which are basically, you know, criminalizing, um, potentially criminalizing a lot of journalism and social media activity. Um, and then you have just regimes like, you know, in places like Cambodia and Laos and, um, well, now Myanmar, which are, you know, which are very difficult for reporting. So, um, again, it, it really is based on a local, the local circumstances rather than sort of like, um, you know, sort of like general, but, uh, yeah, there's definitely, it's not easy to be an environmental journalist. Great. Uh, thanks, Rhett. Um, a question from Julie on compelling visuals, especially for explaining data. Do you rely on the scientists for that? Or does Monga Bay and your journalists work with the scientists on making effective graphics? Um, so it depends on the context. So, so for like a quick news story that's covering a paper rather than like a long feature, we'd be more likely to rely on the, um, on the researcher to provide the, the graphic. Um, that said, Mangabe is building more capacity to do visualizations. So, you know, we're aspiring to have a much more um, data visualization centric approach to journalism. Um, we're not there yet, but I would say in the next two years, we should have more capacity there. So we're starting to do some, you know, some experiments and some projects, but it's very early stage for us just by the nature of, you know, the, the, the level of resources we have. So, you know, an entity like the New York Times can can invest a lot in sort of doing those visual visualizations. But the trick is how do you get the New York Times to care about your research? Um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's much hard. It's just a much, much harder to sort of get your, get your work in front of the New York Times. But if you do, then, you know, they do have the potentially the capacity to to do those really nice visualizations. Great. Um, a related question is that you, you you mentioned that you share your content freely to anyone who wants to take it up and republish it, um, and you also provide access to data sets. For example, you showed us the um, Global Forest Watch uh, data set, and um, you provide information on forest loss and, and land use change, and this is free access. Um, have you had issues with content or data being changed or, or misinterpreted? Um, and, and, and how can you address that issue? Um, I mean, it's not a big issue, but from time to time it happens like FAO, we used to rely more on FAO forest data, which sometimes will be revised without, you know, without notification. So, um, that's happened a few times, but it's not a major problem. Um, you know, the, the Brazilian government will sometimes revise their numbers slightly on deforestation. Um, but yeah, I would say Mangabe is not super data. Like we don't have a ton of data sets we're putting out there for people to use um, at this point. Um, but generally it's not that big an issue for us. 
Okay. Um, question from Jenna. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Do, do the majority of your stories come from journalists inve investigating stories they, they happen to come across, or do the majority originate from pictures people send, or is it a pretty, pretty even mix? I mean, it's really a pretty diverse mix. So we have like a pipeline of story ideas that are coming into like Manga Bay Central, you know, via various ways. Um, that's both like direct pitches from scientists and NGOs, but then also, um, you know, various journals. So like we're monitoring journals and trying to turn around reporting on those studies coming out. Um, but then we are also, and so sometimes, you know, the story ideas come in and then we reach out to um, our, our network of contributors to then cover that work. Um, but we also take pitches from that network of journalists. So, um, you know, maybe we'll have a journalist somewhere in the Amazon and they, they find something interesting and then they'll, they'll pitch an editor and then that editor will commission the story. So we, we basically get story ideas from all over the place and then end up producing those, those stories, um, you know, via various mechanisms. So it's kind of very diversified. Great. Um, you mentioned that conservation scientists can craft their message and then, then share it with your journalists. And then the journalists can get it out to the public through articles in Mongo Bay. But can the, the scientists themselves write their own stories and get them published at Mongo Bay? And how much of that happens? And um, are there also are there courses that can be taken that teach the basic writing skills that can enable a conservation scientist to actually write their own story? Um, yeah, so for the first question, um, we have commentaries um, that we carry on Manga Bay that are often written by, um, by scientists. Um, we have certain rules about it because we basically don't want to just become a press release service for, for scientists. And so this, the, the concept of, of the submissions, like the, the editorial submissions are, really about talking about an idea rather than someone's own research. So you can do some research on something, but the, the editorial is not an opportunity to just talk about research. It's really talking about like the issue. So if you've done research on, I don't know, like land use change in the Amazon, you could write an op-ed about why Bolsonaro's decision to like rescind a law has impact on deforestation or something. So it's really kind of the bigger picture stuff. Uh, implications of your research rather than writing by your own research that we that will do uh that would you know that, that will run um sorry what was the second question oh the, the, the training um yeah i mean so there's there's definitely uh, media training that's often offered by um universities and even um like societies sometimes um we like Manga Bay doesn't have like a training program, but we do occasionally, you know, have like little webinar workshops. It's not primarily what we do, but th there are there are programs out there. So again, a lot of a lot of um, universities have been investing in sort of that kind of training as a way to elevate the work of their scientists. Great, thanks. Uh, a question from Christopher. I run a one-man science news website here in Uganda. The readership is low. How do I progress? I'm unable to recruit the second and third journalists. Um, so there are a few issues there. So I mean, one issue is your audience. So how do you grow your audience? And that's, that's really tricky. I mean, um, it's always changing. So... I mean, really, what Manga Bay's focus has been has been has been uh, producing the original content that's you know only found on Manga Bay. I mean, until it gets syndicated, um, and presenting it in a way that's attractive to you know people we want to have read it. So we also work on distribution via social media. So you know, promoting every story, things like that. So building up that audience. And so the second part of the question of attracting journalists. So um, I mean, we pay our journalists. So I mean, that's that's attractive. Um, so we pay journalists either on a per story or like a per project basis. Um, in terms of recruiting journalists to work for free, um, I mean, I, I don't know the context here, but um, I think it's trickier to find people to do, um, to work for free. I mean, it's, um, you have to be really passionate about it, but I mean, our, our model is, is paying journalists to do the reporting. So um, we generally find that 
there's a lot of hunger among environmental journalists to have opportunities. I mean, I think paid opportunities is probably the key word there. But um, you know, when we put out a pitch for call or a call for story pitches, um, you know, we get a pretty healthy number of, um, of of you know pitches coming in. And then whenever we have a job opening, we have a lot of journals applying for it. So I think it's like a combination of two things. It's one like building your audience and your readership. And then the second thing is like having the ability to pay journalists to do, to do reporting. Great, uh, we have a question from Maria. In which journals are you most likely to find stories that excite you? I guess she's meaning peer review journals. Are there some that seem to always have something interesting or underrated? So this is a question I could answer better a few years ago when I did more reporting myself. So there were certain journals that I monitored. So there are the big ones like PNAS, Science, Nature. And then there are, then there are ones like Conservation Letters. Um, sorry, it's been a long time. I mean, there's like, there's a whole list, but um, it's not necessarily critical. Like the journal is not necessarily that critical actually, if you have an interesting study and you can explain it well. So there are studies that will appear in pretty obscure journals that will get a lot of media pickup because they're on something, um, you know, unusual or interesting. So while it's important, obviously, to, to go for like the well-known journals, I wouldn't say that that's like a limiting factor. Like if, if your journal, if you don't make, if your paper doesn't make like the dream journal that you want it to get in, you can still go a long way with uh, media pickup if it's a interesting study, um, you know, that can be conveyed well to um to a journalist or sort of you know the mass market great um so one question that i have um relates to you know how scb scientists can engage with monga bay what are the ways in which we can potentially collaborate with Mon monga bay as an organization um, I mean, so one thing we've talked about is doing is actually doing one of those media workshops at some point um, to help journalists or to help um, uh, SCB scientists or members, um, you know, understand the more specifics of, of, of writing a pitch and things like that. Um, I mean, another thing is just for SCB members to, um, you know, to pitch their stories to Manga Bay, um, you know, that either the process I mentioned of looking at a specific byline author or, you know, pitching them to editors. Um, I would say just like reading manga based stories and getting a sense of the kind of stuff that we tend to cover um, is very helpful. Um, just increases the likelihood that your story will get picked up. So, um, you know, I would say you, you can do that just by subscribing to the site or following us on social media, things like that. Um, I mean, those are things that come to mind just off the top of my head, but there's probably other things as well. Um, but those are just, <laughs> I guess, the start, the starting points. Right. Um, so, if uh, members would like to submit a story, would like to, you know, pitch a, an idea to you, how how can they contact Monga Bay? Yeah. So, either editor at mongabay.com goes to like our main newsroom editor, and then that's distributed to the appropriate person, or you could reach out to a journalist who's covered something in your area. And so, the contact information for um, you know, for staff writers and editors is listed on the site. So, um, you know, if there's something say on arboreal camera trapping, and that's something that you're like really into and write papers about, um, you can see who on Manga Bay has written a story about arboreal camera trapping and reach out either to the bindlined author or at the bottom of the page, it'll have like an editor and you could reach out to that editor about that pitch. Um, the other thing to do is um, on mangabay.org, which is kind of, um, which is the site that's about Manga Bay itself. So mangabay.com is where our content lives and that's where the content's distributed. Mangabay.org is like the about page essentially. And so um, there's a section which is um, called opportunities and that talks about some of the special reporting projects that we have. And so if your research relates to one of those special reporting projects, um, I would say that increases the likelihood of, of, of your paper finding an audience significantly. So um, I mean, I've kind of thrown out a lot there, but look at the opportunities page for Manga Bay, you know, look, look at what Manga Bay journalists are reporting on things that are related to, to your issue. Uh, and then, you know, sending a message to the just editor at mangabay.com. 
Great. Um, SCB holds uh, conferences uh, on a regular basis. We have regional conferences which are organized by our sections and we also have our global conference, the ICCB. Um, do your journalists uh, attend those conferences and, and can they meet you and, uh, and, and have a chat with you about their science? Um, yeah, I mean, so pre-pandemic, we typically had someone from Manga Bay attending most of those conferences. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I would say there's a good chance that someone from Manga Bay will be at a conference once things open up again. Um, I guess you can, you can often search like the attendee list to see who's there. Um, I don't myself attend a lot of conferences, but um, you know, some someone usually regional will be there. So if there's you know a SCB in in Singapore, then someone from our Southeast Asia bureau would would be there. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, just a final um, question, uh, which I'll 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 leave you with, um, and this is actually a question from Emerson. Um, Rhett, you've got so much exposure to many environmental trends. Uh, I'm curious, which particular environmental issues do you think need more attention from scientists? Um, that's, that's a good question. So, I mean, that's always evolving, but I mean, like a couple of years ago, I would have said the intersection between forests and um, precipitation, like rainfall pattern, because that's something that actually leads to policy action. So if there's understanding that, you know, deforest the, deforestation in the Amazon is gonna affect uh, power generation and agricultural output in, you know, Southern South America, that's something that policymakers will respond to. So I tend to think that the, the sort of pragmatic side of things, so under, the, if you're doing research that actually has practical implications, for policymaking, um, that kind of stuff is really important, um, especially around you know environmental problems. Um, so that would be sort of like the general frame I would apply to um, where science is particularly impactful. Thanks, Red. Great. Well, look, we've come to the top of the hour, and we'd really like to thank you so much for giving us your time and giving us guidance on on how Monga Bay can help. Um, to get the word out about what's happening on the ground um, and how we can get our science out into the into the public uh, sphere. So um, we've got a lot of uh, great tips and guidance from you, and uh, I'm sure that our members will be uh, contacting Monga Bay to pitch some ideas to you, and and hopefully we'll see you and some of your your journalists at the next uh, ICCB and at our regional conferences, and look forward to. Um, uh, working with uh, Monga Bay and um, getting the, the conservation out there. So thanks very much, Rhett, and uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for our Conservation Voices webinar. We really appreciate your uh, participation and uh, you know, thanks uh, for um, the questions and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, working with you uh, in getting um, science communication um, uh, out there um, through SCB. Thanks, Rhett, and thank Great. you all. Thanks for the opportunity.